Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And I've got one of my favorite guests coming up tonight, Michael Schratt. Uh, he has done great research over the years. He's an aviation historian and uh, he does meticulous work in his investigations. And tonight we're going to be talking about UFO crash retrievals. It should be a very interesting show. Uh, thank you all for showing up here. Thank you, those who support the show. Anyone can do that over at podcastufo.com under support the show. Uh, a couple of things. The blog this week is a uh, from Charles Lear, as usual, is a 1665 UFO report from Strasland, Germany. It uh, talks about a lot of the work of Chris Aubach, who I've been trying to get on the show. Hopefully, I'll get him on one of these days. Uh, but it's a great article, and check that out over at podcastufo.com. Uh, a lot of you know this already. It's uh, old news to most of you out there that pay attention to what's going on. But basically, the Schumer Rounds um, Act was more or less gutted, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, something is passing, but it's very, very weak. And uh, so it's, you know, I've heard people say it's up to, um, you know, all of us to, you know, push this thing along and, and perhaps maybe we'll have some more whistleblowers uh, come coming forward. I know uh, someone uh, sent me something saying to look for David Grush's op-ed coming out soon. It's going to be more revealing. I'm not sure. We'll see how all that goes. Um, but one of the things that came to mind is if, if uh, you know, one of the things that was gutted was the eminent domain and uh, for any hardware or anything that these private corporations uh, like Lockheed Martin or places like that may hold. I say may because I don't know, but uh, uh, all that was gutted. And, you know, my question is, why would it be gutted if there was nothing to hide? That, uh, you know, maybe it's that's kind of conspiratorial, but it makes sense to me that uh, if they had nothing to hide, they wouldn't care whether that was in there or not. And I'm talking about the people that are, are funded campaign funds uh, that were involved in this from places like Lockheed Martin. And uh, so uh, I'm just name dropping, but I'm sure there's many others. And uh, it's just too bad that this thing was gutted. And now it's up to us and the whistleblowers to try to get more answers. And hopefully that will happen. So I'm ready to bring in the guests. Uh, Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, Martin. Good to be with you. Yeah, great to have you back. It's been a couple of years. Yep. And uh, I really enjoyed the last time. And I remember there was a person that was doing your illustrating. Is that uh, we're going to be seeing the same illustrations this evening? Well, I've got three illustrators that I'm working with. And uh, you'll ah. see you'll see all of that tonight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Some great great work uh do you want to go ahead and you want to dive right into yep, it and we can, we can uh we can do that hold that right up that. okay yep all right, all right. So, so would you like me to make this the full page uh let's see here oh it doesn't matter that? okay yeah, i think we can see that pretty good yeah all right so you see that full screen right i do yes okay good all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna move forward here and this presentation is called retrievals of the third kind Cosmic crashes, corpses, and cover-ups. And I want to kind of lay the groundwork here. And I always like to start here. UFO crash retrieval is the ultimate holy grail of UFO research. Uh, why, why am I calling it the holy grail? It's because it's very simple. The crash retrievals contain everything we need to move this field forward. Now, they just axed this UAP disclosure legislation last week. So now it's really up to the whistleblowers and you know people who are in this field that are trying to release and get access to, and this is part of this whole holy grail here, the bodies, the debris, and the craft, because these are the three key elements that we're going to need to move this field forward, to bring this into congressional hearings. Um, this is the vehicle that is going to bring about disclosure. All right, a couple of quick announcements before we get into this here. The content of each case highlighted in this presentation has remained intact for the description of the original source. The identity of first-hand sources will be protected per Leonard Stringfield's original agreement with his military contacts. The visual aids used in this presentation are computer-generated forensic composite illustrations and sketches 
which originated from the specific details provided by Leonard's sources. Sources for the material covered in this presentation include the following. So here, here are the first-hand military sources that Leonard Stringfield used to basically compile his crash retrieval accounts. Three-star U.S. Air Force generals, U.S. Air Force fighter pilots, astronauts, commercial pilots, air traffic controllers, neurosurgeons, pathologists, theoretical uh, physicists and mathematicians, U.S. Army officers, U.S. Navy officers, military police, high-level Pentagon officials, top military brass, scientists and engineers who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and other government facilities. So that's just a cross-section of the people that we'll be examining here tonight. A couple of quick quotes here. Number one, UFO crash retrievals can't be real because if they were, I would have read about them in the local newspaper. That's the general public talking here. Number two, there are not now, nor ever have been, any extraterrestrial visitors or equipment on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is their uh, very own press release, July 1980. So that's what they're saying. And what we're going to do here tonight is we're going to challenge them. We're going to challenge them with our best top military witnesses. So it's going to be the witnesses against this press release and the government. And let's see who comes out on top here. Okay, this is the gentleman that we're highlighting his work. Leonard Stringfield is the godfather of these crash retrieval cases. Um, he actually coined the term UFO crash retrievals. And over at least a 30-year period, he collected dozens, uh, I count 100, 119 total, of these crash retrieval cases. And that's what we're going to talk about here. A couple of quick uh, biographical points here. Leonard Stringfield was born 1920, grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. By the time he graduated from high school in 1939, he had already memorized the entire dictionary. He joined the military as soon as he heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. He was employed by a chemical company in Ohio and retired after 30 years. He wrote two books, one in 1957, one in 1977, which was called Situation Read the UFO Siege. Uh, next one, his lecture on UFO crash retrievals at the 1978 MUFON Symposium in Dayton, Ohio, caused an international sensation. Yeah, it, it did, because this whole concept about UFO crash retrievals was still very early back then. This is something that wasn't really talked about. And the agreement that Leonard made with his firsthand witnesses is that he could retain an important part of our national history by getting the story out, but he, he could not use their names. And so that's why there was a little bit of pushback when he was at this MUFON symposium. He passed away December 18th, 1994. Okay, so this is Cincinnati Inquirer, July 19th, 1993. It says, author continues quest for truth about UFOs. Quote, what I've collected has staggering implications for mankind. This would be the biggest thing since Christ, really. And you could make an argument, yes, it, it would be. Uh, actual contact, debris, bodies, craft, the actual physical evidence. It is the biggest thing since this time period. So that's what we want to look at here. Now, somewhere out there, we believe there are 22 bank boxes of original letters, correspondence, uh, drawings, tapes, sketches, illustrations from Leonard's firsthand witnesses. I know about 15 years ago, there was um, probably a six-figure sum offered for this collection, but it was turned down. Uh, I've been kind of on the trail of tracking this thing. I've been told that most of this has been thrown out, and Leonard only want, wanted some things published from his anonymous sources. Maybe that's true. I have reason to believe perhaps that there might be still something left. So at, at the very least, there were 22 bank boxes somewhere around 1991 time frame, and it'd be great to track these original boxes down. So everything that we're going to be talking about, Martin, this evening comes from Leonard's book here, UFO Crash Retrievals, 1978 to 1994. So if anyone wants to follow along, and I would recommend if you're interested in this subject matter, you can get this book on Amazon. It's $100. It's not cheap. It's relatively thick. It's not for the faint of heart. There's a lot of technical reading in here. I mean, we're talking about crash retrievals. We're talking about bodies. 
We're talking about military covert operations, uh, bringing these craft on 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boys and shipping them to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Eglin Air Force Base, uh, McDill Air Force Base, Homestead Air Force Base. All of the interworkings of these crash retrieval cases are examined and explained within this book. And it gives you, of course, the page number, the case number, and that's what I'm going to provide here tonight. All right. So, Martin, if you went to Vegas uh, and you knew the odds were 119 to 1 in your favor, would you go to Vegas, uh, Martin? What, what do you think? Uh, I'd be on a jet, uh, the next private jet I could find. Yes. That's right. So I've got this uh, picture here on the right. And let's just say there's 121, 120 spaces here, and you bet 119, you're, you're going to win every time. You almost cannot lose. I mean, the odds are in your favor. That's what we've got here. We've got 119 crash retrieval cases. All we need is for one of these to be authentic. And then the whole concept about this whole thing being a non-event completely falls apart. All we need is one. So really the odds are in our favor here. I want to give credit to my artist, Rudy Gardea, who did all of the pencil sketches in this illustration. And we're going to start right here. This is Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, 1946. It had not become Wright-Patterson Air Force Base because the Air Force didn't exist back in 1946. Now, this was a private. He worked in records management. And the book for this is Space the Final Frontier, page 59 by Clark McClellan. This is the only time we're going to divert from this. But... On page 59, this is the cover of the book here for anyone who's interested. And I'm going to move forward to the sketch. Here's what this craft looked like. This is in the book here. Now, this is 1946. This is before Roswell. This craft came in on a railroad flat car from Arkansas. It was 15 feet across. It was 7 feet high. It had a series of rectangular windows wrapped around the outer circumference. It was highly polished, mere reflective. There was a central column that rose from the bottom of the craft all the way to the top. And when they looked inside, it was antiseptically sterile. The exterior skin, as I mentioned before, had this chrome polished exterior finish to it. Uh, no, Basically no seams. There were no rivets. There were no fasteners. There were no socket head cap screws. There were no weld marks. It looked like this thing was done on a 3D printer on an atomic level. Uh, so here's my technical drawing that shows you what this thing looks like. If you look at the upper right hand corner, I've cut back the skin and now you can see the central column that rose from the bottom all the way to the top. And this thing was three feet in diameter. That's the diameter of the central column. Looking in the craft, it appeared to be antiseptically sterile. There were no display screens, there were no seats, no nothing. Now, I want to bring your attention to this little red dot on the front window here. And this is the attempted point of entry that these lab coat technicians, according to this military source, they were using a diamond tip drill bit trying to breach this glass pane window, if you want to call it that. If that's what it was, they could not get in. So let's take everything we do, that we have from the sketch from the original eyewitness. And this is my first pass color illustration of what this thing may look like. And then this is my friend, J Joseph Wraith. He did a good job uh, doing a nice colorized version of this. And if you look in the right-hand corner, we've pulled back the skin. Now you can see inside here. And they're using these diamond tip drill bits to get inside these craft and they can't do it. They're desperately trying to reverse engineer the metallurgical technology and apply it to the aerospace industry. That's clearly what they're doing. And that's one reason why they totally canceled this whole UAP legislation. Uh, that's definitely one reason why, for sure. So here is the drawing by Rudy that gives you an idea. So we've got the private and records management. We have his MP friend that he met when he was delivering a letter to one of these higher ups at uh, Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, back in 1946. And this guy said, you know what? I got something I want to show you. So he brings him in this hangar they go to this far area in the back of the hangar, and this craft is sitting on the concrete floor of the hangar. There's a toolbox in the foreground. It has an electric drill off to the left with a diamond tip drill bit. There's a folded up tarp off to the right-hand bottom section, and he's just looking at this thing. He can't believe what he's seeing. So I told my friend Joseph Wraith, okay, we've got to do 
a color illustration, putting together everything from Rudy's sketch right here, putting everything together from the original sketch, from the eyewitness report, from his two page report, all is put together and let's see if we can get there as though we were actually there. And so here's what we came up with. This is the closest approximation that we could get something that looks similar to this. And it, it may still be there or they may have moved the assets underground or to another location. But back in 46, this is what these military sources are telling us that's there. Next one, Papagos Indian Reservation west of Globe, Arizona, 1947. And this is north of Superstition Mountains. The witness served in the U.S. Navy during World War II. And this is page 93 from the book that I already talked about. It's case A-10. And let's go to the drawing by Rudy here. So these two men are going down this unimproved area. It's this desert terrain. If you've been anywhere around the Superstition Mountains, you know it's, it's pretty desolate there. And they come across these two MPs with carbides and they're challenged. They're not allowed to go any further. About another 50 foot off to the left, augured in at about a 40 degree angle, is this 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft, has a dome on top. It has these two rims wrapped around the outer circumference. There's these indented sections wrapped around and they're, they're challenged about this and they're told to evacuate the area immediately. But they, they did get a good look at this thing and I've, I've provided the page number so you can read about the reference. But now let's take this sketch and let's go to a full color rendering. And this is what my friend Joel Payne came up with. I wanna give him credit for this. And you can see this military operation uh, ongoing. It's 1947. We, we haven't even made it to Roswell yet, actually. Hmm. So we're already two in. And if we factor in Cape Girardeau, we're three in. And if we factor in 1942, Battle of Los Angeles, now we're looking at four to five craft they've already recovered. And this is before Roswell. So we're at least five retrieval cases in, and we haven't even made it to Roswell yet. Okay, so let's keep on going here. White Sands Missile Range, July 4th, 1947. So now we're, we're finally here. We're finally here. This is a U.S. Army Air Force technical sergeant page 196 in the book. Now, I've got the White Sands perimeter shown on this map here, and I want to stress that this entire retrieval operation took place at night, and here is Ruby's drawing. This thing was about 150 feet in diameter. When it came down, they had this military convoy go over to this thing. It was kind of tipped off on an angle, somewhat buried in the sand, and they brought in light alls, they brought in spotlights, they brought in high intensity lights, they had uh, people with Geiger counters, they had people with still cameras, they had motion picture film reels rolling, and this is all at night. They've got this, Martin. They have got the craft and they've got the uh, motion picture film reel, they've got the still camera photography, probably eight by 10 black and white glossy photographs. So they, they've got it. The question is, can our senators and our congressmen, do they have a high enough security clearance and a need to know to get access to this information? And that's where this brick wall keeps on coming up here. All right, so let's see if we can make this into a, a nice full color rendering. This is by- Just Joel one quick Payne. question yep. for you, Michael. Go ahead. In a situation like this, if they actually recover something that's like 100 or 150 feet right. wide, how could they possibly transport something like that? Okay, two, two things. Number one, in some of these cases, they find out that these things disassemble in pie segments and they put the pie pieces on M123 tank transporters and they move it over to the base. That's one, one way they can do it. That has happened in another uh, number of different retrieval operations, including 1948 Aztec, New Mexico. Okay. So on this one, you can see the lights. You can see the tents in the, in the background here off to the right. You can see the motion picture film reel. We've got people with Geiger counters. And so and another thing, too, is when these things get to be too big, the logistics of moving them are just too much. And Martin, as you know, they bury these at the site. And that's happened multiple mm -hmm. times as well. So this is 1947 White Sands Missile Range. And let's move on here. We kind of talked about here. Uh, actionable item. Since still photography and motion picture film was recorded of this event, 
senators and congressmen with the appropriate security clearances should track down and utilize this evidence for future public hearings. Yeah, needs to happen. Next one, hmm. UFO crash retrievals, 1947, seen at a warehouse at Berkeley University of all places. <laughs> Albert Bruce Collins, now deceased, he's the primary witness on this case. He was a metallurgical engineer, and this is uh, UFO crash retrievals, page 197. So here we've got this engineer. He's at the right place at the right time. This 18-wheeler tractor trailer low boy backs in to this warehouse at Berkeley, and this guy is, I can't believe I'm seeing this here, and this is what he is seeing, according to the witness here. This was a 30 foot long egg shaped craft. It was 15 feet high. It had a crack in it. So it looked like a cracked egg and you could see the interior yolk, which was three feet in diameter. Off to the forward section of this cracked egg, it looked like it had, they had a composite panel. And then there was another composite panel that wrapped around the outer circumference of this yolk. And then off to the right, there was the shrapnel, like there was an internal implosion and it kicked out this debris. So here's here's a couple of questions. Number one, first question is, is this the entire craft itself or is this the propulsion system for something much larger? If this thing is already 30 feet in diameter or 30 feet across, what could this be powering? Where did they get hmm. this thing? Uh, it could go to something much larger or it could be the actual craft itself. And then the other thing is he talked about being involved in the debris. So obviously they had samples, they had probably uh, smaller samples, maybe three, three inches by six inches, something like that, something more manageable. Can we get access to some of that debris for analysis by the scientific community? Is that even possible? It's gonna be hard to get this egg, but maybe we could get a piece of the debris, what would be much easier to get. And so here is our full color rendering by Joel Payne, just to give you an idea of what this retrieval operation is looking like here. So now we're we're five and six in, we're at the Roswell time frame, and you can see that the body count goes up, the craft count goes up, the debris that they have goes up, and it's being farmed out to defense contractors to different universities all around the country. And you know the deal that they've cut with uh, the government here is. They, they made a deal with the contractors and they said, I, I don't care what you do. You can commercialize this. You can profit from it. I don't care what you have to do. But we want to exploit the technology and propulsion systems for weapons advancement like they always do. That's absolutely one reason why. So you can see this dirty deal that the government cut with the defense contractors. OK, next one. Fort Polk, Louisiana. Summer 1953, private in the Army. This is case A1, page 80. Very good case. Here's what this thing looked like. It's a very similar egg that we already talked about here. Mm. Egg-shaped mm. craft, 30 feet across. It had what looked like a fin that was wrapping around the outer portion of it. It was still rotating when the retrieval team got there. Now, when they got there, it had this kind of uh, burnt red embers on the ground. They were still hot. They were still warm. And... Mm. What they ended up doing is there were at least two military, you could call them um, ambulance type medical personnel. They were assisting three ET beings coming out of the craft from this hatchway. One of them had already been carried out on a stretcher. And in the report that you can read if you get this book, it says that the three comrades were trying to establish communication with their fallen comrade who was being carried off to the ambulance truck here. These things were three and a half to four feet tall. They had oversized head. They had oversized eyes. They had a slit for a mouth. They had minute nose. They were wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suit. They had a helmet on. And then Martin, and I'm not making this up. This is in the report. It said that they were wearing mittens. And then it also said that they had no knee joints. So when they were walking across this terrain, they were walking with only their hip joints. It was this staggered, bizarre type way to walk, but that's what this report talks about here. So here is my friend Joseph Wraith. This is his full color rendering, just to give you an idea of what the scene might look like. You can kind of see on the ground, it's got this red burnished uh, dirt type appearance. You can see the hatchway open up. Now I want to zoom in here so we can get a little bit better look here. Now you can see these ETs coming out the craft being 
assisted by the medical personnel. And then we'll move on to the next one here. This gives you an idea what this stretcher scene might look like, carrying him, him off to the ambulance truck. And this is a little bit of a blow up here. But this whole co concept of these one-piece tight-fitting flight suits that are fully integrated almost into the skin of the beings themselves, that keeps popping up again and again. An interesting technology here. Okay, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 1953. Uh, this is a Army Reserves Warrant Officer. We have his name. His name is Michael Olvey. You know, th this really is the final curtain call on, on disclosure. Now, we're at this point now where we need to make a critical management decision because if, if we don't get this information out there, uh, this is going to pass like two ships in the night and we're never going to get to the bottom of, of all this. So this really is the final curtain call. We, we've got to come together We've got to make a management decision and we've got to identify these surviving witnesses so that they can come forward. We can find their bosses that will bring us to the debris, the craft and the body. So this is 1953, uh, page 15, abstract number eight. So the scene here is a four engine cargo aircraft lands at night at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And I believe it may have been this ha hangar complex here, number four. I don't know for sure. It didn't say. It just said a hangar at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And it might be this last one, Bay E. I've actually been in that hangar. This is a photograph of that hangar. And so you've got this DC-7 cargo ship. And th picture this scene taking place inside a hangar. So the, the four-engine DC-7 taxis onto the tarmac. It goes into the hangar. The hangar bay door shut, and there, there's a port aft cargo bay door that opens up, and then they bring a forklift, and they bring these crates down, Martin, and inside this hangar, this warrant officer is looking at this whole scene. He's close enough to see as these forks come down, there's three wooden crates on top with their lids off, and he looked over inside. I'm going to take you inside this hangar now, and he sees three bodies. They're three and a half feet long. They're wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suit. Uh, they have an oversized head. They have oversized eyes. One of them was female. They were all being supported off of the wooden crates with this white netting that protected it from the dry ice freezer burn below. And you know, he's watching all this. He's looking at this. He's got a, a close enough view on all this. He later learned uh, about the debris that came from the crash retrieval operation. And what I want to do now is I'm going to take you to the full color illustration as though we were actually there by my friend Joseph Wraith. And this is what it looks like here. The best approximation that we can put together uh, of what we're talking about here. I mean, it's just staggering the implications of what this means. They're, they're keeping this information from the general public, from America, from all around the world. Can we handle this truth? Um, I think at this point we can. We're going to examine this concept here. Now let's do a, a top view looking down. He did say that one of them had breasts. So he, it was his assumption that at least one of these was female and they were wearing this one piece tight fitting flight suit that we've heard again and again. That keeps on popping right. up. So this yeah. is 1953. Right, Patterson Air Force Base. All right, let's go to the next one here. This is Walker. And just Air just a second there. It looked like right. they had opposable opposable thumbs. Too. Um, yeah, in this case, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, a, a question for you um, is: I was just thinking about my audio listeners because I have a vast, you know, audio uh, audience, and okay. um, the only thing I can think to say is to go into the show notes and breeze through the. Uh, the video that will be in the show notes. Uh, but I just wanted to get that out there because uh, to see all these uh, illustrations are really nicely done. Thank you. Well, I can't yeah. take credit for it all. It's it's a united coalition here. Next one, Walker Air Force Base, New Mexico, April 12th, 1954. Uh, served in the Air Force 1954 to 1955. That's our source here. It's on page 82. So if you want more information, it's on page 82 of the book. Now, I want to keep this in mind. Walker Air Force Base used to be Roswell Army Airfield back in 1947. It later became Walker Air Force Base. 
so essentially we're talking about the same place here. So this is 1954. And this particular witness, he was told to board an H-19 helicopter, like right now. So he jumps in this helicopter. This is at night. They take off. They head northbound. They make a left-hand turn. Now they're heading northwest toward Corona, like where the original crash was back in July 1947. So they're hovering over this scene. And on the starboard side of the helicopter, which is on the far side, he opens up this bay door and he's looking down at the scene. And what does he see? He sees this. This is a 40 to 50 foot diameter dish shaped craft. They have a spotlight shining down on it. He has a handheld camera. He's taking photographs of this. So they've got those photos. Um, and he's just shocked in total awe about what he's seeing. They eventually land the helicopter where this craft was. And Martin, the very first thing that this gentleman noticed, he said that the whole surrounding localized area smelled like automobile battery acid. Mm. That's the first thing that he noticed. And then mm. they noticed that there absolutely were four small ET bodies next to the craft. There was an entryway hatch door that was opened up. They got inside. They looked inside. There were two more bodies. So they had six bodies with this retrieval operation. There were lights around the outer circumference of the craft. They were still rotating when they got to the scene. So let's go to the next color slide here by Jewel, just to give a, people an idea of what this thing looks like. So again, this thing is approximately 50 feet in diameter. They're hovering over this thing. And again, th this body count just keeps on going up. As these years progress, the craft count goes up, the body count goes up. And early on in the 40s and 50s, it definitely appears that all roads lead to Rome. But in this case, all roads lead to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But later on, uh, there, there does appear to be some good evidence that they started diversifying their portfolio. And these assets started being shipped to other locations like Eglin Air Force Base, McDill Air Force Base, Edwards Air Force Base, just three examples. Okay, next one. December 1963, Cherry Point, North Carolina, U.S. Marine, Roy Baker, that's his name. This is page 152 from the book, Case 2. Now, in this case, he is stationed at this Cherry Point facility here, and I've got the map that shows you where this is. This is just a little bit north of Havelock, uh, North Carolina. And so he boards a plane with blacked out windows. He flies three hours by plane from Cherry Point, North Carolina to a location that he wasn't told about. And when he got there, they opened up these hangar doors. He looked inside and he saw this. <clears throat> this was propped up on scaffolding. There's a 40 foot diameter hamburger shaped UFO. It was 15 feet high. It had nine elliptically shaped windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. They were opaque, so you really couldn't look inside. There was a one-inch lip between the outer skin of the craft itself and the outer portion of these opaque windows. It was chrome polished aluminum exterior finish. Uh, really no seams, no visible means of propulsion, no uh, socket head cap screws, no rivets, no nothing like that. Now, he did say that there was just a very tiny hint of a seam, if you could call it that. You could not put a razor blade in there. And what they were doing in this case is they were taking a diamond tip drill bit and they were trying to pierce into the skin of the craft and they couldn't do it. So this is the second time we, we've heard about this now. Here is Joseph Race illustration that shows you all of these red dots are the attempted points of entry. So they were trying to drill into where the seams were and it, it didn't work. Okay, so let's move to the next one here. And these are the three avenues that they used. Number one was a diamond tip drill bit that completely failed. Then they tried an acetylene torch. That didn't work. And then the final opportunity was a laser, and that didn't work either. So you can see here what they've been trying to do over the last, you could call it 70 years. That's minimum 70 years, is they've been desperately trying to reverse engineer the metallurgical technology associated with these vehicles and implement them into our aerospace assets like stealth fighters, stealth bombers, and things that they don't even talk about. That's what they're trying to do. There's no question about that. Now, I want to bring this to your attention, Martin, this drawing here. This is 
a sketch by the Marine himself. This is not a copy. This is not someone else's drawing. This is absolutely the gentleman who actually guarded this thing for two weeks at this location. I'm going to break this down. So you can see here, the craft is supported by the scaffolding. It's a rough sketch, but it's got some good things here. There's two entryway points. There's one on the left. There's one on the right. They have a catwalk where you can walk around this whole thing. You could walk under this thing because it was propped off all off the hangar floor by about five feet. On the upper left and right-hand corners, you've got these lights. And he said that they had this thing extremely excruciatingly well lit. There were no shadows in here. So that's one thing you want to do is when you have a retrieval operation and you're trying to reverse engineer the technology of these things, you want to have a very well lit area. Now, if you look on the bottom of the craft, you've got these black sections. Those are the pads that uh, were used to support this craft on the scaffolding. And then if you look at to the second to the last window, that is one of these entryway points that they tried to drill with a diamond trip drill bit and it failed. So let's yeah. go to Michael Johnstone's drawing. This was done in 1986. He interviewed Roy Baker back in 1986. Um, so this is a little bit more of a refined drawing now. And if you look to the left-hand side of this craft where the uh, window is, you can kind of see this one-inch lip. It's a little bit exaggerated in, in this drawing, but there was a one-inch lip between the outer skin of the craft itself and the outer portion of these opaque windows. So let's go to the cleaned up drawing here. And now you can see how this thing comes into view. I did a little bit of a detailed drawing that shows you this lip here. We've got a five foot dimension that is being uh, propped up on the scaffolding off the floor. And just gonna go over a couple of these bullet items. Number one, there was a white circle taped to the floor directly below this craft that no one was allowed to enter. So you're talking about, you know, maybe someone came over. There was a high up congressman or senator. If they went beyond that white circle, this Marine was told to shoot first and ask questions later. Oh, uh, a couple of other bullet points here. A team of between 20 to 50 engineers examined the craft, but were unable to gain access to it. Uh, the window and the craft were indented toward the interior. That's what we have with this detailed drawing here. Now, let's go to the next one here. This is by Joseph Ray. Now we can kind of see what we're actually dealing with here. This is probably the best we're going to get. Uh, it's not going to get much better than that. This is like the best illustration that we can get. And you can see these lab coat technicians. You've got the scaffolding. You've got the catwalk. That's talked about. And we're going to talk a little bit later is they had a color code badging system. So if you had a yellow badge, you could go here. If you had a green badge, you had access to one location, but not the other location. If you had a red badge, you had access to the entire facility. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later here. Now, this was the first pass uh, color illustration. And you can see here, when they failed with the acetylene torch, the report says that they brought in two tractor trailers with these electrical generating devices on them. They led these heavy gauge cables into the hangar and they were shining a laser on the side of the craft to get inside. And when they moved the laser away, it was warm to the touch, but it had no effect to the craft itself. The kind of material that you want our stealth fighters to be using. Okay, next one. Now, Martin, what I wanna do now is I wanna take you inside this facility like we are a fly and we're gonna penetrate this chain link fence and we're gonna get access to this classified super secret facility here. And let's move a little bit closer. Now we made it through this chain link fence. We're gonna start getting this whole thing into view. Now we're finally in the scene here. And remember this thing is approximately 40 feet in diameter, approximately 15 feet tall. You've got the nine elliptically shaped windows. You can see here, there's this white circle that's uh, taped to the floor. You've got military personnel. You've got some suitors here. You've got the white lab coat technicians and anyone who was not authorized to enter that circle was shot right on the spot, no question about it. Okay, so we're a little bit lower than eye level now. You've got some spook groups involved in this whole operation. And like I said before, we're already five, six, seven, eight into this already. And, and these craft count just keep on going higher. Now you can kind of see these elliptical shaped windows. You can sort of see the one inch lip 
Now we, we've exaggerated these seams in here so that you can just get an idea of, of what these seams look like. This is approximately a 45 degree look down angle. This is all coming into view here. Very well lit area. And I'm sure that they have duplicated this scene multiple times. Like they've got scaffolding, they've got a catwalk, they prop these things off the hangar floor and this happens again and again. And a once, question on, on, on this one in particular, uh, was there ever, ever any talk on how this thing was downed in the first place? Nope. And where, was no, where it was? There was no mention of that by Roy Baker. Nope. He, he was never mm -hmm. briefed on that. His job was to guard this thing per, for a period of two weeks in December 1963. This is, this is literally days and a week and a half or two weeks after the Kennedy assassination, November 22nd, 1963. So no, he was never told how they got it and he was never told where it went when it left. Yeah, and, that was the next question. Yep. And nope. the thing the thing that people always, uh, you know, I always hear people, uh, people's opinions, I'm sure you hear this too. Uh, how could these things get here and why would they crash here if they can get here from you know, I mean, it's only opinions, but I mean, it just seems like there's a lot more than I was ever aware of that uh, yeah. reported crashes. I, I agree with you. And uh, that we can make a very good case that in a lot of these instances, um, there is a rogue group within the military industrial complex who is targeting, tracking and shooting these things down for military weapons applications. And they're trying to reverse engineer the metallurgical technologies the propulsion systems and the free energy systems associated with these vehicles. That is appearing what's going on here. That's what, what we seem, the evidence is leading to that conclusion. Now, on the last day that he was there, he said that they were taking this craft off the scaffolding. They had built kind of this cradle system. They were putting it on an 18 wheeler tractor trailer, low boy truck. They dropped it down on this trailer and then they put tarps over it chains over that and then moving it to the next location so now we're, we're beginning this tarping operation and they have a cradle system here let's let's start showing these tarps going over so now we've got approximately 50 percent of the craft covered by this tarp uh we're fully tarped up at this time we're getting ready to ship out and you know after the two weeks were over this was like the last time you ever saw this thing. It was being moved to the next location. So now it's completely out of the facility and they're moving it to the next location. So the two ways that they keep a lot of this secret is number one, they compartmentalize this. No, no one person knows all of it because they keep compartmentalizing all of this. And number two, as they move these assets from location to location and they don't spend any long duration at any one location. No. Maybe there's something that's been here for a while, but early on in these crash retrieval operations early on, they kept moving these things so that no one could actually get tabs on here. All right, so this was Rudy's drawing. This was our first pass drawing just to give an idea of what it looked like as they were shipping this thing out here. Now I wanna mention this Marine, Roy Baker, and I hope he's still alive. He said that when they brought the laser over to the side of the craft, and they turn this laser on, it bounced off, reflected, and damaged a ceiling tile over in this facility. He talks about this in great detail. Here's the, here's the incident right here. It actually damaged this ceiling tile. Here's now, in 1963, do we have that? Did we have the really that, good that's laser what he technology? Said. That, that, yeah. is the, that is the date. That is the date. And I've heard of this before. Um, I'm, I'm going strictly by what this Marine had stated. And, and the date mm -hmm. is December 1963. Mm -hmm. They were they were in their you know infancy time frame, but apparently we did have some laser technology in 63. I don't know the intensity, but at the very least, mm -hmm. uh, that is adhering to the correct date according to the Marine here. Here's his sketch on this very incident. And you can see the reflection off and then the damage to the upper section of the ceiling tile here. Now here's these color-coded badges. So off to the left, and these are all the white lab coat technicians. Green badge gave you access to this part of the facility, but not this other part. Yellow badge, you could go maybe off to the left of the craft or you could go under the craft. 
red badge gave you complete access to the entire facility. So he definitely mentioned in the notes that I got from Michael Johnstone about three pages of detailed handwritten notes about this whole operation. He talked about the color-coded badges. He talked about the laser. He talked about the scaffolding. All of this is within the original notes. Now, he did say that when he was guarding this craft for a period of two weeks, and his job was to basically shake down people who would go into this because he was guarding this whole area. But there was one time where no one really checked him. So he got into this facility alone with a Minox camera, and he took a photograph of this thing. This is his direct quote. Someday I will tell this story, and by God, people are going to believe me. But unfortunately, Martin, that photograph was lost in a flood back in 1983. So, you know, we were this close of getting a good piece of evidence, but it got snapped right out of our hands. And this keeps on happening again and again. So I talked to my friend Joseph. I said, Joseph, let's see if we can do a replica of what this Minox camera would have looked like if we were there. And uh, this is what he came up with. So it's got this gray brown tone to it. It's a little bit fuzzy out of focus, but this is the best representation that we could put forward based on the time frame, the type of camera, the, you know, perhaps the lighting, but this is the best that we could come up with a, with a replica. Now, he did say, this is according to the Marine who was there and guarded this thing. He said that there was a secretary of the Navy who just about walked across that tape circle on the floor and he almost got shot. So obviously I started digging and I looked at the date, December 1963. Who was the Secretary of the Navy back in December 1963? Well, it's this gentleman, Paul Nitz. He would have been the one. Um, I can't guarantee it 100%, but he did say it was the Secretary of the Navy. So it would have been this gentleman uh, that would have been in the facility. He would have saw this. He probably had a need to know about some part of it, but not all of it. And that's why he almost got shot. So that's another gentleman. Now, four-star Major General Melvin F. McNichol. He plays an interesting part of this whole story here. He was base commander at Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma. And I've got his obituary here. Ex-Tinker Commander Melvin McNichol dies. Daily, Oklahoma, July 11th, 1986. Now, why am I bringing this up, Martin? Why am I switching gears to this? Tinker Air Force Base guy. Well, it turns out that this general is oh, yeah. very good friends or was very good friends with Charlotte Mann. Charlotte Mann is she involved is. Yeah. in Cape Girardeau. People who follow mm -hmm. this whole thing know who this Charlotte Mann is. She gave a lecture five and a half years ago at IUFOC in Phoenix. She talked about- I was the there. Yep. Oh, you were there. Okay. You were there. Yeah. <laughs> so you, did you see her there? Yeah, I actually had her as a guest on my show as oh, well. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. well, there you go. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Uh -huh. she, she held the photograph of the ET being propped up by uh, farm personnel back in 1941 in Cape Girardeau. So she actually held that photograph. And she had a mutual interest with UFOs with Melvin McNichol. And they were friends. And they both had mm -hmm. this UFO interest. So she turns to the general and says, General, are you still my friend? You know, we've been friends all these years. We've got this interest in UFOs and you never told me anything. You never gave me one little bone. I mean, are we still friends here? What's going on? So he turns to Charlotte and he says, Charlotte, if you ever repeat what I'm about to tell you, not only will I deny it, it could end my career. And this is what the general told Charlotte. Number one, he said he saw a UFO which was located in the West that tracks with the Marine we just talked about because he said he was in Cherry Point, North Carolina. He boarded a plane with blacked out windows and he flew three hours. That will put you within the West, just barely. Number two, he said to Charlotte that he walked around a UFO on a catwalk, which was propped up by scaffolding. This is exactly what the Marine had told Michael Johnstone. So now we got two pieces. Number three, bodies were recovered and one was still alive. This Marine at this facility uh, back in 1963, December 1963, he overheard water cooler talk by these lab coat technicians about bodies being recovered and one was still alive. And when I heard this from Charlotte, I said, I got it now because I knew this Marine 
did not know uh, this, I mean, this uh, general, I'm sh I have a good feeling that he didn't know about this Marine and certainly Charlotte didn't know about this Marine from 1963. And when I heard that story, I said, Martin, I got it now. I, I can mm. confirm this case because I have secondary independent confirmation basically describing the identical features. Uh, so I think we've got a real case here. Why would this Marine lie? He talks about this in great detail. Uh, and this is verified by this general here, almost like the identical characteristics. Next one. We'll just keep on going here. Fort Riley, Kansas, December 10th, 1964. Primary witness was 1st Division Air in Quebec, served in the infantry. This is Crash Retrieval's page 24, abstract 20 by Leonard Stringfield. Uh, I'm going to go to the map here. This is Camp Foresight, where this thing came down. Our witness boarded this six by six troop transport with a couple other uh, personnel. They go about a half a mile down this road. They're all toward it. This is all at night. They're ordered to get out of the trailer of this vehicle. They start walking into this wide open area and there's a Bell UH-1 helicopter crisscrossing the screen, this whole entire area with a spotlight shining down. And when they got there, this is what they saw. This is a 48-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It had these strange square box-like structures that were jutting out from the outer circumference of the craft itself. It was 18 feet tall. It had what looked like a fin that originated from the center and tapered back to the end part of the craft itself. Below that fin, Martin, there was what looked like an exhaust port. And I'm going to go to the full-color rendering to give everybody an idea of what this thing actually looks like. This is back in 1964. And then here's Rudy's drawing of what the scene looked like. Now you can see on the lower right-hand corner, there's a gentleman with a Geiger counter. Uh, this guard, um, he actually was told to guard this thing overnight. He got a real good look at this thing up close. Uh, they had retrieval operation there, other military personnel. So now what I wanna do is I wanna take it to the next level and let's go to the full color rendering to give an idea of what this may have looked like. Now, there were, you could call them MIB black suitors at this facility, military facility. Uh, you've got the UH-1 helicopter. Now you can see this fin on the aft part of the craft. You can also see this uh, exhaust port. And then if you look closely, you can see these box-like structures that wrap around the outer circumference of the craft itself. I'm going to go to another illustration to give you a different angle now little bit different angle. This is kind of a 45 degree angle, but still off to the left just slightly. And we can kind of see this exhaust port at the back. So as we continue to go through these, um, it's just mind boggling how the cases and the craft just keep on adding up. Now, the only reason that I bring this case up is because there was a secondary independent source not known by the original source who stated that right after this happened, there he saw an M123 tractor trailer tank, tank transporter going up this winding hill road. He was coming in the opposite direction. It was blocked off. He saw the same craft on this trailer. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to, I, Go I'm gonna have to interrupt just for a second. I have to say, cause it's a hard stop here tonight. Yep. Uh, thank you all at KGRA <laughs> radio and we'll see you next week. And now we can continue on. Okay. Sorry. No yeah. problem. No problem. So he, he saw the same craft that our witness saw, but this thing was on this trailer. It had a tarp on top. There were chains over that, and he was being ordered to evacuate the area immediately. So we had two sources now that confirmed this particular craft coming from this facility here. And the people who were by the trailer were wearing these biological hazard protective suits on. That's what he mentioned. This in great detail. All right. Next one. Uh, this is going to be a very bizarre case, but I'm including it anyway because it's part of this whole narrative here. So this is Dayton, Ohio, 1965, Air Force Museum, UFO Crash Retrievals, page 93, case 11. And anyone who wants to play a role in this case can actually do this today. You can actually go here today. And in this case, there was a couple that was looking at the V2 rocket display. This is the exact same V2 rocket that they were looking at back in 1965. So you've got this husband and wife, and they're just looking at this V2 rocket display. The husband 
leaves his wife stranded by the V-2 rocket. He starts wandering the back halls of the Air Force Museum, completely leaving his wife stranded at this German V-2 rocket display. He busts through, he's going through these corridors of the uh, back portion of the Air Force Museum. He busts through these off-limits double doors, and he is met with the shock of his life. He sees an E.T. Mm -hmm. being about three and a half feet tall, very large head, very large brow ridge, oversized eyes. He was wearing a one-piece, loose-fitting Mercury spacesuit. It had this crinkled aluminum exterior to it. And I'm going to go to Rudy's drawing to give you an idea what this thing looks like. It was pointing its index finger toward our witness here. And this guy is like completely shocked out of his mind. He can't believe what's going on here. Uh, this thing had a slit for a mouth, minute nose, pointing its index finger at the witness. Within 10 seconds of him seeing this ET being who apparently escaped its underground containment center over on the Patterson side of the base, the military portion of it, not directly at the Air Force Museum, but there may have been a connecting tunnelway where he escaped out and got through. 10 seconds later, all these buzzers and sirens and lights started going off in the Air Force Museum, and there were MPs ushering people outside the doors. And so that's what Rudy's drawn here in this detailed view on the on lower right-hand corner. So this is back in 1965. So did this guy come across an ET being that was accidentally brought out of his containment center? Who knows? But it's part of the story. It's part of the Leonard Stringfield collection here. All right, next one. Wright Patterson Air Force Base, 1966. This is page 17, abstract number 13. Civil service electrician. Uh, he had just come home from working at the base. His son was still up and uh, he had a trench coat on. And he said, you know what? I got something I want to show you. So he re reached inside his breast coat pocket. He pulled out a black and white 8 by 10 glossy photograph. And uh, this is what it was depicting, Martin. There was a ET, a, a deceased ET, wearing a one-piece tight-fitting flight suit. It was about three and a half feet tall, oversized head. Um, it was being propped up by its wrist by two personnel. One off to the left was this lab coat technician. The one off to the right was wearing khakis and military looking boots. And he is just shocked at what his father is showing him. He can't believe it. Now, the next morning when this, the father brought this photograph back to the base, it was discovered that it was being, it was missing and they tracked it down to him and he was fired on the spot. It did not end well for this uh, contractor, or this electrical contractor. Now in the background, it talked about this being a Southwestern scene. So it could be New Mexico. It could have been Arizona, one of the two, but there absolutely was a Southwestern landscape in the background. So this could have been an earlier retrieval somewhere in Arizona or New Mexico. Next one, Southwest July 3rd, 1967. This is a Marine rank was private and first class. Uh, and he was told to guard a 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft back in 1967. This is page 86, case A5. And in this case, you can see this Quonset style prefabricated hangar. And by the third day, curiosity got the best of him. So he walked over to this you could call it an aircraft prefabricated hangar. He kind of pulled back these flaps and he looked inside. He wasn't supposed to do this, but he just couldn't stand it anymore. So he looked inside and he saw this 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft, it had a dome on top. There were these, you could call them tables, lab coat, uh, lab technician tables. There was micrometers, there were calipers on there. They had other a metal type equipment there off to the right hand corner of this hangar, which you see here, there was a walk-in freezer and there were body bags near the walk-in freezer. He did not see any bodies, but he definitely said that he could see this walk-in freezer. There were MPs with carbides on there. He was eventually reprimanded for looking inside. And so in a nutshell, that's this case from July 3rd, 1967. And let's go to the full color rendering just to give people a little bit clearer idea what this may have looked like. So you, you see these workbenches, you've got the craft itself, uh, you've got the walk-in freezer, we've got the body bags there. And what these craft really are looking like 
is they've got these smooth contouring composite curvature to them. There's really no seams. There's absolutely no rivets. That's what these witnesses are telling us. And for 70 to 80 years now, it absolutely appears that elements within the military industrial complex, the defense contractors, universities are desperately trying to reverse engineer the technology uh, of these particular craft. All right, next one. This is a very good case. This is Fort Hood, Texas, late 60s. So I believe 1968 timeframe. This is a private pilot and this is crash retrievals page 91. So in this case, we've got Fort Hood. Now, I want to highlight this, that embedded within Fort Hood is a place called Robert Gray Army Airfield. And there is an unimproved runway near this facility right here. And our witness had to make an emergency landing. He was in a 172. He makes this emergency landing. And you can see Rudy's sketch here. Off to the left, we've got the uh, 172 pilot. As soon as he lands, literally within 60 seconds, this Jeep pulls up. There's two MPs. They both pull out their 45 caliber pistols. They're pointing it to the 172. He's out of the airplane now with his hands up. And now while all this is going on, there is this massive bypass door that opens up, probably 400 feet across. This massive bypass door opens up. Now it had shrubbery on top. It had rocks on there. It had low, you could call it desert terrain. It blends in with the surrounding background. You would never know that there's an underground facility here, let alone that there's an underground runway here. He said that he could see what looked like Cray computers. Uh, he also said that there were what looked like droids that were monitoring the floor of this. They were going back and forth. And then we heard reports that there are UFOs coming from Gray Army Airfield that are being escorted by military helicopters. So that would bring in the CH-47 double rotor Chinook helicopters. That's absolutely consistent with what the witnesses are telling us. So if we take it back in time, we've got the Eddie Lexan uh, craft from 1966. We've got other dish-shaped craft here. If we go forward in time, the Cash Landrum craft could have originated from this facility. Any number of vehicles could have originated from, from this facility. But this looks, Martin, to be an underground staging area for test flights of man-made UFOs that are being escorted by military helicopters. We keep getting report after report of these things. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Is there a top secret vast underground facility located at Gray Army Airfield? The witnesses are telling us there absolutely is. Okay, now a couple of quick notes, and this is all in the book. Tommy Blonde, who's a researcher, he interviewed someone called Colonel X. And this is on page 100. I think it's important that we look at this here. Here's what he says. The colonel stated that underground installations, as well as isolated areas of military reservations, have squadrons of unmarked helicopters, which have sophisticated instrumentation on board that are dispatched to areas of UFO activity to monitor these craft or lift them out of the area if one has malfunction. So, uh, Martin, can you think of any UFO case where something malfunctioned? Oh, you mean like uh, something of ours malfunctioned? Yeah, like let, Maelstrom, let's just Maelstrom or or car, uh, you know, car stalling out, things like that. Well, is that when what you you're have talking a, about? Or? When you when you have a when you have a man-made UFO that had a malfunction, does anything come oh. to mind? <laughs> oh yes, uh, Cash Landrum. Good. Well done. Okay. Good. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll cover it here. I was gonna. I was gonna ask you about that. Uh, which, oh, you know, sure. Well, I we'll, remember we'll, when I had Colby Landrum on. You and I had a discussion way back. Way back. Yeah. Nice. Yep. That's right. Uh, yeah. Now the next one here is page ninety-two. Here's what what this uh, colonel said here. Quote: The technology that is being applied in this underground complex would remind someone of a science fiction thriller. It is unbelievable what they know and can do from this area. That's exactly what the witnesses are telling us here. Okay, so they're saying that they're seeing UFOs being escorted by these double rotor Chinook CH-47 helicopters. And so now I want to take it to the Cash Landrum incident. 
This is December 29th, 1980, Hoffman, Texas. It's just after 9 p.m. So we've got Betty Cash, we've got Vicki Landrum, we've got uh, Colby Landrum. They're heading southbound, and they had already given up trying to find two bingo games. They already gave it up. So they're deciding to go back to Dayton to drop off Vicki. And as they're heading southbound, Colby, who was in the back seat, notices this uh, white light off to the right. And this thing keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, the entire area lights up, almost like daylight. And they see this 90-foot tall, as big as a water tower, double ice cream cone device with the large ends connected. There appears to be a slight flat section where the, uh, where the two miles of the craft met. And there was what looked like um, lighted porthole windows. The bottom of it was chopped off. That almost looked like it was chopped off with a butter knife. And as this craft kept bobbing down, because they were all in the car, and this is December 29th, 1980, there was a blue colored flame that came out of the bottom of the craft, and then it bobbed back up again. And this pattern would repeat. Now, by this time, they're essentially all horrified. Betty Cash gets out of the vehicle. She opens up the car door. She walks toward the hood of the vehicle, and she stat, sat there, or she stood there watching this thing for at least five minutes. Uh, Vicki Landrum and Colby Landrum also got out of the car very briefly. So it was Vicki who was off to the right, and Colby was kind of pinned between Vicki and the car itself, the frame of the car entryway door on the right-hand side. Eventually, those two get back in the vehicle. Betty walks back to the car door, grabs the handle and burns her hand. She had to use the uh, flaps of her jacket to open up the, uh, the handle and get inside. Now, by the time they both got in, and this is December 29th, 1980, back in winter time, it was so boiling hot inside the vehicle that Betty had to turn on the air conditioner. Now, one other thing I didn't mention is that when this finally came down in front of them, it was only 150 feet in front of them, Betty slammed on the brakes and then Vicky went forward, putting her hands on the dash pad. And to this day, and if this vehicle is still alive, is still around, Vicky's handprints are melted into the dash pad. That's a, that's a piece of phys physical evidence that would still wow. be there. Now you've got, as this thing now passes by, they counted no less than 23 double rotor Chinook CH-47 helicopters. There were at least two uh, Bell UH-1s and one Sikorsky Sky Crane chasing after this thing, just like the Colonel had talked about. And this is all December 29th, 1980. So here is the Clarion Ledger, December 25th, 1983. What did three Texans encounter? Sighting of UFO brought illnesses, uh, but few answers. Within minutes of Betty uh, dropping off Vicky, they all three of them felt the effects of radiation poisoning. Um, they threw up. They uh, lost their hair. They had sores. Uh, Vicky's face swelled up completely. Uh, it was a horrible scene, horrible scene. Now, Betty is no longer with us. Vicky is no longer with us. Colby is the sole surviving witness to this whole encounter. Now, there's one other thing I want to, two other things I want to highlight here. Number one is after this happened, like almost immediately after this happened, not too long after, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and they dug up the road and they repaved it. Two weeks later, they came back and they dug it up a second time and they repaved it a second time. So you, you tell me, Martin, if, if there's nothing to this, why would yeah. the Army Corps of Engineers repave the once the road once and then repave it again twice, second time? Mm -mm. Nope, we, we got something going on here. It appears to be a craft that had a hole breach on the inside of the reactor, and it started spewing out fissionable material, and they were at the wrong place at the wrong time and got this radiation poisoning. Uh, that appears to be what the actually going on here. Now, here is the uh, Florida Today, December 4th, 1983. And you can see X marks the spot here of where this all went down. Uh, so here is our full color rendering by Joel Payne. This is what this underground runway may look like. Now, in the report within the book, it also talks about four engine cargo planes, C-130s landing at this facility. So you could land cargo planes in here, more than likely, you could land F-16s, F-15s in here if you had to. 
other helicopters, CH-47s, so will have no problem getting out of this facility and entering back in. So this just goes to show you that there is a massive underground world going on beneath our noses that are paid for by these classified black budget programs. Okay, so next one. California before we move on, just before Go we ahead. move on to this next one, just um, I'm in touch with Colby every now and then, and yeah. uh, and he put out there publicly. I mean, I wouldn't say this, but I mean, I think he's having some health issues, and I'm not sure if it's related okay. to uh, the possible radiation. But I mean, why else would they tear out the road? It, you, you're right; it has to be something to do with radiation, I would yeah. imagine. And what the about other... the vegetation in that area? Mm, yeah, I know. The, I'm sure that the bark on the trees was affected and the surrounding vegetation and, and brush was also affected. There, there's no question. It has to be. It has to be because that thing was spewing all over that entire area. And here's the other thing. If there's 23 uh, double rotor Chinook helicopters and each one has a crew of three or more, plus the uh, UH-1s and plus the Sikorsky Sky, Sky Crane, we're looking at at least 100 personnel. And I, I don't think that they were shielded for radiation oh, uh, unless they were wearing lead uh, suits the whole time. I don't know. But so there's another avenue so, to follow up on. So your, your, your thoughts on this is this is maybe some part of a reversed engineered craft or some type of craft, but it was on like a nuclear. Well, according to John Schusler. And according to, and I don't know how much we should believe him because he's a disinformation agent, Richard Doty. Oh, yeah. Basically mm -hmm. talking about it's an ET craft with pilots on board that had a retrofitted man-made propulsion system. Now, I, I lean to more of a, a man-made aspect all the way. I mean, technically mm -hmm. it could be either, but I'm leaning much more toward a completely man-made craft with potential pilots on board with a atomic engine that had a hole breach in the reactor. And that's what this thing actually is. Um, and then yeah, the, other thing I wanted, could be. Yep, mm -hmm. the other thing I wanted to point out is that after all this was over, the Air Force tried to buy Betty's car. That's another <laughs> point here. Yep. Why, why would the Air Force be interested in Betty's car? For, for no reason at all. Doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yep. Uh, that's something. All right. So California City summer 1971 uh primary eyewitness is debbie clayton this is page 233 in the book and basically what they hear is this large booming noise and this was a kind of a tight-knit community there weren't too many people here at that local vicinity back in 1971 so there was about four witnesses that go down to the end of the block and they see this 10 foot wide by five foot tall dish-shaped craft that has a mushroom top that rolls around, kind of got this mushroom appearance. Within minutes, there was a military convoy that showed up that had kind of a, a tank transporter. I wouldn't call it exactly that, but definitely a six-by-six six troop transporter. There was a trailer with an attached crane. They set up a lanyard system with an eye hook, and then they brought that back onto the back of the trailer. Now, while all this is going on, before the military got there, the one of the witnesses had a handheld camera and he was taking photographs of this whole operation. When this Air Force brass got to these witnesses, he threw that camera down and told these guys to get out of here immediately. But they saw this whole retrieval operation. Okay, next one. And how much time do we have here, Martin? Uh, we can keep going until we wrap this up as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so we'll, we'll do yeah. a couple more do a couple more cases here. So this yeah. is North. Norton Air Force Base, 1973, and this is an Air Force photographer who was stationed in Hawaii at the time. He had a security clearance upgraded. He was flown to Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino, California. He was joined by another Air Force photographer. They get inside this vehicle. They, try, they travel about an hour from Norton Air Force Base, and then the car stops, Martin, completely stops. And they drop down into this underground facility they're told to exit the vehicle. They go into another room in this underground facility. They're told to disrobe completely nude and go into these medical smocks, these white medical smocks that covers their entire body up to their faces. And then there's like a face covering here that's got a transparent section here. And once they come out, they're led into this large underground facility. And this is what they see, Martin. They see this crane. 
supporting by a netting or lanyard device. This is a 30 foot diameter dish shaped craft and they're both told to go into a cherry picker and go inside the entryway of this craft and start photographing the interior of the craft. Now, I want to mention that this gentleman said that the craft was 30 feet in diameter, but when he got inside the craft bar and he said, quote, I could have thrown a football as hard as I could and not hit the other side. So there is something going on within the interior of this craft. There's a space-time continuum. There's a, a gravity well. There's an optical warping going on, something going on with gravity, space, and time that allows the interior to appear 10 times larger than the exterior. That absolutely happened. So on the upper left-hand blow-up enlargement here, I, I told Rudy to give me something that just shows the large vastness of this craft. So he was taking photographs of the interior panels, the display screens, and then when they were done taking photographs of the interior, he said they were led to another room and told to photograph the autopsy of three ET bodies. He mentioned that as well. And so that's all within this case here. So now what I want to do is take you inside this underground facility. We've got an overhead crane in this particular case with this netting. And this thing is 30 feet in diameter. Here's a little bit larger detail view. And now I want to take you inside the craft itself, Martin. And here's what my friend Joseph Wraith came up with. Now, in this case, you could throw a football as hard as you could not hit the other side. This may have been what it looked like when this gentleman was inside photographing the interior components of this craft. But this is what these witnesses are telling. And this is not an isolated incident. There are other cases um, that also talk about the interior of these craft are at least 10 times larger than the exterior dimension. Okay, so here's- I've heard that yep. many, many times over the years. And it's like, you know, something that looks 30 feet wide and they go in and it just expands on and on. And I think, um, you know, the Travis Walton, Travis Walton talks about, you know, this this whole strange thing after he wakes up and everything, all the expanse of everything, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. It's it's not an isolated case. Uh, mm -hmm. Others talk about this in, in historical cases as well. All right, so then of course I started digging, right? Do we have any proof of these underground facilities? So here is the LA Times, June 11th, 1972, tube shuttle using electromagnetic suspension. It says here, LA to New York in half an hour, 10,000 mile an hour tunnel train plan developed. This is back in 1972. This is public literature here. Here's the detailed view of the cutaway and you can see these vacuum pumps, emergency bumpers, lateral coils. In this article, they talk about the uh, intricate details of how they're going to do this. So then I started digging even further to try to support this case here, and I ran across this document. This is Rand Corporation Proceedings of the Second Protective Construction Symposium, Deep Underground Construction, Volume 2, March 24th, 25th, 26th, 1959, by the Rand Corporation. These are their own documents here. Here's what they say, Martin. Just as airplanes, ships, and automobiles have given man mastery of the surface of the earth, tunnel boring machines and shaft sinkers will give him access to the subterranean world. It is our aim to provide machines which will supply the ever-increasing demand in mining and construction of underground facilities. So bottom line here, Martin, at least by 1959, they're already talking about this underground world, these deep underground bases, these tunnels, mm. uh, it's already a done deal. This is back in 1959. There's no telling how evolved that this whole thing has gone. All of the bases, mm. all the tube tunnel systems, there's no telling how deep this really goes. Mm. Yeah, those boring machines are something else. I've seen Absolutely. you know, some, some uh, documentaries on them and they're just scary. They could, they really could keep tunneling and I, I just don't understand what happens to the, the dispersed, you know, uh, rocks and everything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. they, there's sort of like a melting type of situation going on there too. So yep. we've seen the patents of the nuclear powered tunnel boring machines that melt the debris into glass that makes up the interior walls of the craft. We, we've heard of those. We've seen those patents. So that, that checks out as well. Actionable mm -hmm. items. Senators and congressmen with the appropriate security clearances should locate this facility. 
find out what is stored there and what other ground installations this may be connected to. Yeah, that needs to happen. That needs to happen. We just took a hit last week regarding UAP disclosure legislation. So now it's even more important that these witnesses come forward and we, we need to, uh, again, this is the final curtain call. Time to make a management decision here. Hmm. U.S. Mean Marine diver off the coast of Okinawa in 1991. Uh, 50 foot per side triangle at a depth of 1.5 miles. Uh, I'm going to give Greer the uh, credit for digging this up within the collection here. So this is off the coast of Okinawa in 1991. And this is what the craft looked like. Uh, this is Finally, the, finally, we got a triangle. Yep, a triangle shaped craft, <laughs> 1.5 yeah. miles down. So they, they notice that there's radiation coming from this area. They go in a DSRV, they drop down to 1.5 miles, and they see this triangular shaped craft 50 feet per side. Uh, they do retrieve this thing, but before they do, they could see that it was buried within the silt about uh, hmm, probably between three to four feet. And they estimate approximately 40 to 50 years it's been sitting there at the bottom of the ocean. So they bring this thing up. They see that it has these hieroglyphic lettering on the uh, side wall of the craft itself. Here's Joel's uh, illustration that shows you what this thing looks like. And uh, this is just another one of these retrieval operations. Uh, this thing was uh, bigger than a, well, close to the size of an F-14. That's the way they describe it in this report. But And we've got one of these deep sea uh, fish here. But just to give you an idea that these things are at the bottom of the ocean. And we're, later, if we have time, we'll go into who might be retrieving these craft. Okay, next one. McClellan Air Force Base, 1973. Chris Kofi, via test pilot astronaut Ellison Unizuka. This is page 153 in the book. This is case three. So in this case, we've got Ellison Unizuka, who at this time was a test pilot. They're at McClellan Air Force Base. This is near Sacramento, California. They go into a briefing room. And there's this is Ellison Unizuka here, a good picture of him. They go into this briefing room. There's about 12 other uh, pilots there. And there's a general, Air Force general, sitting in back of a movie projector. All the lights go down. The movie projector's turned on. And on this forward wall is this three to five minute black and white film clip of two ET bodies on slabs. And Ellison is thinking, oh my God, I, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. He's like shocked about all this. He just... He can't believe what he's seeing here. And I'm going to go to the next slide here. And I want to reference this from Open Minds. And this is at the same facility. And this is David Armstrong claims his aunt used to work for a top secret UFO records library at McClellan Air Force Base. In his 20s, Armstrong went to visit her and knowing he had an interest in the subject, Armstrong says his aunt let him take a look at the files. So... Here we've got two independent sources that are essentially confirming that ET photographs, uh, eight by 10 black and whites, motion picture film reel, were at one time stored at a classified library at McClellan Air Force Base. Now, later, Ellison Onizuka became an astronaut and two weeks after a particular date, Leonard Stringfield was going to interview. So they had this interview all set up. They had the date picked out. They're all going to have a fantastic. And he was going to tell Leonard Stringfield all about this motion picture film reel that he saw back at McClellan Air Force Base in 1973. But unfortunately, uh, Martin, we lost him in the Challenger accident back on January 28th, 1986. Oh, oh wow. So we were this close yeah. of getting the testimony of an astronaut who saw a black and white film clip of an ET, two ETs on uh, concrete slabs. Now, when that film was over, the lights went back on, there was no debrief, and then they all walked out. So it, it looks like what this is, it is a trial balloon, and they're trying to gauge the reaction of our top military pilots could they handle this new reality or would they collapse under this new reality? Could they handle this new paradigm shifting reality? That's what appears to be happening because within the book, if you read this book, this film pops up between three and five different locations all around the country. And so it looks like they ship this thing all around 
and they bring these military pilots into these facilities and they do these hmm, unannounced movies with no debrief. And then afterward, they're told almost nothing about this or they're told right. that what you just saw was a hoax and forget all about it. That's what's going on here. Uh, it's confirmed by at least five separate cases within the book. All right, next one, 1974. We'll, we'll do a couple more here. This is right, Patterson Air Force Base, 1974, page 327. Now, primary eyewitness had just given her two-week notice, and she's at a dinner party engagement. Her new boss is coincidentally also at this same dinner party. And her boss could tell that her new hire is getting beat up in this dinner party engagement because they're talking about UFOs and she's getting beat up. So he turns to her and he says, do you want to see the physical evidence? And she says to him, now? And he says, yeah, now. So he takes her in, in his car. They drive to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. He had the correct security clearance to go through this magnetic card key entryway. They walk down this long corridor. There's another key entryway section. So he brings out his card one more time with a magnetic strip on it. He inserts it into this reader and this door opens up, leading them down another corridor into an underground morgue that has all these handles and uh, doors that open up. So he pulls on one of these hand handles and then off on this call it a chassis on roller, comes out this table with this ET body half out of a zipper body bag. This thing was about four feet tall, the same oversized head, oversized eyes, slit for a mouth, minute nose, and she's looking at this thing. Uh, basically, the eyes are, are somewhat open, and she's she can't believe what she's seeing here. She's absolutely shocked. You can imagine she's just like totally in shock. So he brings her back into his vehicle, he drives her home, and on the way home, she's just contemplating this whole new reality that she's learned about. She shot to her absolute core. Now, when her two weeks is up, because she had already given her two-week notice, on the Monday morning that she's supposed to report to work, she uh, talks to the office manager, and the office manager tells her, uh, I'm sorry, uh, miss, but your boss um, died about two weeks ago, and there's no mention of him in the obituaries within the local newspapers. So something happened to this guy. <laughs> Maybe mm. he spoke too soon. He got her into the unacknowledged. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to bring her. But this guy, uh, it appears he was uh, terminated for what he did. Yeah. So this is something that, to be aware of. I mean, when, when you play with the varsity team here and you're dealing with physical evidence, now you're on a completely different ball field here. This is, you know, you're playing with the big boys now, and they do mm. not relinquish their crown jewels easily to anyone. There's a price to be paid for this kind of stuff. And that's well, what I'm sure you know, it, if he's using a, an electric, you know, card that they yep. know that he accessed it at night. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So this is what this lady described on this bizarre night that she went to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So when you look at all these cases, Martin, and you've got military personnel, you've got people who handled the bodies, you've got people who drove these things into the base, you've got other witnesses who saw DC-7 four-engine cargo transport planes enter these facilities. It's coming in from all different angles here, and they're all converging on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is exactly what Barry Goldwater had talked about to Curtis LeMay. And he said, you know, General, I know you guys have a, a room in this in this base where you keep all this material, the bodies, the debris, the craft, uh, gun camera footage, motion picture film reels, glossy for, can I go in there? So he turns to Barry and he says, damn it, Barry, don't you ever ask me that question again because if you do, I'll be court-martialed. Um, and basically he shut the whole thing down. That's the only time he ever got mad at uh, Barry but that's how it went down. So if there's nothing to any of this, why would General LeMay go off on Barry Goldwater? What was he trying to hide if he couldn't even get in there? Mm. These questions just keep on asking. And, you know, maybe maybe one or two of these witnesses, maybe they're hoaxing. Maybe they're just telling a lie. But when you take 119 
firsthand military witnesses that keep telling us about the the bodies, the debris, the crap. You, you cannot tell me that all 119 are lying. Why would this lady lie? I mean, she just shows up at work not knowing anything about what she's going to be told within the next 60 seconds. And then it, she just, she, she finds out about this new reality. Why would she lie? No, I, I tend to trust. And we've other, other reference librarians are telling us people who worked at uh, cataloging bases within Wright Patterson Air Force Base. They're telling us about these. Okay. We'll do a couple more here. This is late 1950s Air Force pilot, Ed Kamarak. He saw a five to six uh, minute film clip that depicted a large 60 foot diameter dish shaped craft in a military hangar. There were three bodies off to the right that had kind of what looked like covers on them. There was a hull breach on the upper section of the dome. They showed the propulsion system and what appeared to be uh, buttons, switches, dials, and levers, and a display screen on the inside. This is coming from this uh, Air Force pilot, 1950s time frame. Here's an enlarged version of both the propulsion system and the display panel on the inside wall of the craft itself. Uh, one or two more here. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, 1962. This is 354th Tactical Air Command Fighter Wing, page 88, case A6. And so these joggers, who are the fighter pilots, are uh, our primary eyewitness. He's in charge of their health. So they're out on a morning run. They're walking down these running down these rows of hangers. They look off to the right. One of these hangar doors is open. They run inside and they see this 15 foot diameter dish shaped craft that they describe as two track and field discus put together with the uh, rims touching each other. It was being propped up off the hangar floor by two engine test sands. They had a roped off section with military personnel with carbides and they're challenging uh, these joggers, and they're basically saying, you know what, you guys aren't allowed here. Get out of here immediately. Now, I want to go to what this pilot said here, which I think is very interesting. Here, here's what it says within the publication. The guard challenged by saying, quote, I don't think you're supposed to be here, sir. I replied to the affirmative, and we turned about face and departed, mumbling to ourselves that the good old U.S. had developed or had all along flying saucers in service. Now, when you have five uh, fighter pilots who saw this and one of them comes forward, um, I think that they make good witnesses. I don't think they're lying. And we've got other uh, reports from pilots that have seen things tucked away in hangars at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So these are what these military witnesses are telling us here. Okay, Roswell, the other Roswell, Noe Torres and my good friend Ruben are the primary yeah. researchers on this case. This mm -hmm. is spring 1955, and this is just across the Texas-Mexican border south of Del Rio, Texas. So here you see this F-86. Now I'm going to set the scene up. We've got at least two B-47s and at least three F-86s. They're heading westbound over southern Texas. And here's the map. And all of a sudden, a dish-shaped craft comes screaming right past their flight path. So one of the F-86s breaks away, and you can see the map here. You've got Del Rio, and then you've got the Rio Grande River. So just south of the Rio Grande River is where this craft came down. So one of these F-86s, he pulls away from the group, and I'm going to go back two slides here. And he does a slow pass over the scene, and he sees this dish-shaped craft, craft here. He makes a left-hand turn heading northbound. He lands at uh, Carswell Air Force Base, gets out of the F-86. He drives to a civilian airport called Corsica. He gets in a two-seat tandem tail dragger Aranka with a friend, and they fly back to the crash site before it gets dark. So I'm going to move forward here, and this is what they saw when they landed. This was about 25 feet in diameter. It was five feet tall. This is a drawing by Rudy. The dome had popped up off the upper portion of the craft itself. There was a hole breach on the side of the craft. When this came in, it left a debris trail. And the primary eyewitness said that the Mexican military, because it was a cold day and it was getting toward nighttime, they were going inside the six by six troop transport that you see off to the left here. And they were taking out blankets 
and they were laying these blankets onto the warm debris from the crash site. And then once the blankets were warm, they were putting on them on their bodies just to warm them up. This is what the witness told uh, our, our uh, researcher. And then that made it into the book here. Now, here's a blow up. This is from Air Force pilot Robert Willingham. He described the bodies and he said, quote, they had arms that look like broomsticks. So now I want to take you to the full color rendering. And now you can see what this whole entire scene, this is by Joel Payne, what it looks like. You can see the Aranka in the foreground right. You've got the troop transport. Uh, you've got the hull breach on the side of the craft. You've got the dome of the craft popped off. You've got the hot debris here. And what I want to do, Martin, is I want to take you inside the craft now to give you kind of a gruesome view of the ET beings that had an unfortunate end here. Uh, it did not end well for them. Kind of like charred and burned, dismembered body. It was not a, a friendly sight. It was a gruesome sight. But this is what this Air Force, Air Force pilot is telling us here. Okay, next one. Koyame incident. Noe, Taurus, and Ruben again. Fantastic job. This is August 25th, 1974, Koyame, Mexico. So there was a dish-shaped craft that was very high altitude, over 70,000 feet. It dropped down to the same level as a Cessna 172 that was heading southbound over southern Texas, and there was a mid-air collision. Here you see the map here, and off to the left it says Koyame, Mexico. Difficult to describe, but uh, this craft was going 2,530 miles an hour, and there was a mid-air collision because it dropped down to the same altitude as, uh, as the 172 did. And we want to go to the next slide. And while all this is going on, the Mexican military is in the midst of this retrieval operation. Elements of the United States intelligence agencies were monitoring the radio traffic from the Mexican soldiers. So the National Security Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency, they were monitoring all this radio traffic. And this is what the scene looked like. They put the craft on a trailer with a tractor. They had a uh, troop transport and a Jeep up front. And they're transporting this dish-shaped craft down this unimproved road. And Martin, do you know what happens next? Hmm. Any idea? Um, is this the one where the military comes in? Well, I, this is this is the case. I mean, where, like there's a there's a confrontation. Well, the Mexican military stops dead. The convoy stops dead, and there are uh, military personnel that are slumped over on the steering wheel. Oh yeah, they're, yeah, That's half right. in and outside of the vehicle. They're laying forward on the uh, driver's side of the vehicle. Some of the other soldiers were laying dead on the ground next to the jeeps. All of the Mexican military were dead. And so we believe, according to Ruben and Noe, right. that there was a biological agent toxic to humans that was associated with this craft. So we had two UH-1 helicopters and one CH-53 C. Stalin fly in. All of our boys are, because they had a whole heads up on this, you know, they had a clue about all this because they were monitoring the radio traffic. So they come in with the CH-53 C. Stallion. They attach this lanyard uh ropes to this craft they hoist it up and uh they ship this thing to cdc headquarters in atlanta georgia now it took multiple refuelings to get there but that's where it was brought ac according to reuben so i want to go over just the helicopters in review here we've got three bell uh1s one ch53 c stallion that are a part of this retrieval operation so let's go to the color illustration just to give everybody an idea of what this retrieval operation looked like. So now we've got the CH-53. We've got the dead Mexican soldiers next to the vehicle convoy. Uh, this craft has already been lifted off the trailer and they're moving it to CDC headquarters. Now let's do a 60 degree angle look down just to give people an idea of what this may have looked like if we were there and were a part of this scene. So these are the kind of operations, Martin, that represent the deepest, darkest secrets of the military intelligence defense contractor community because we're stealing these assets right up from under the noses of another government. So these are some more of the deep black programs uh, within the military industrial complex. So I just wanted to go over a couple of these cases with you, Martin. And uh, it's clear that 
a lot of this information needs to come out with congressional hearings. Uh, we have enough research material and sources to track down these witnesses. Those witnesses could absolutely lead to their bosses and that would eventually lead to these underground facilities where the bodies and the craft and the debris are being kept. And those types of pieces of evidence need to come forward in congressional hearings so that we can get this out into the public domain. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. And, you know, you think about this, uh, you know, I believe you said 119. Mm -hmm. And you think about all we need is one. You That's know, all we need we just, is one. Yep. We just need one to get out there and for to actually be explained. That's but, right. Uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. I really uh, and really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for your amazing work. Oh, no obvious. problem. No yeah. problem. That's yeah. great. Always good All to right. be with you. Yeah. All right. You take care now. Okay. Thanks. Take care. All right. Sure. Bye. Yeah. Bye. All right, everyone. We'll be back next week. I've been uh, hoping to get a confirmation from my guests uh, before this evening, but I do not. So if you'd like to sign up on our uh, mailing list, just go to Podcast UFO. Dot com or I believe if you are in the live chat right now, uh, pinned to the top is where our newsletter is. So we have the upcoming guests and also blogs. So thank you so much for hanging in. And remember, if you are listening to the audio, I might try to put some pictures into the show notes. But uh, at any rate, you can check out the video. Uh, that YouTube video will be right in the show notes, and you can check that out for you know so you can get a visual of the things that we're talking about tonight. Thanks so much, and remember to keep your eyes to the sky.